Welcome. I'm so glad we're able to worship together today. We are closing up our sermon series called Tell Me a Story by looking at the story Jesus told about a man who is with God and a man who is in what we see as hell. Today we're going to actually talk about hell. What is it? Who's there? And what does it really mean? We're going to talk about that. As we prepare to explore this question, let's calm our hearts in our minds. Let us pray. Loving God, refresh us. Invite us to discover your presence in each person we meet and in every event we encounter. Teach us when to speak and when to listen, when to ponder and when to share. In moments of challenge and decision, attune our hearts to the whisperings of your wisdom. As we undertake ordinary and unnoticed tasks, gift us with simple joy. When our day goes well, help us rejoice. When it grows difficult, surprise us with new possibilities. When life is overwhelming, help us to experience your peace. Amen. Today's scripture reading comes from Luke, chapter 16, verses 19. Through 31. There is a rich man who was dressed in purple and fine linen, and who feasted sumptuously every day. And at his gate lay a poor man named Lazarus, covered with sores, who longed to satisfy his hunger with what fell from the rich man's table. Even the dogs would come and lick his sores. The poor man died and was carried away by the angels to be with Abraham. The rich man also died and was buried. In Hades, where he was being tormented, he lifted up his eyes and saw Abram far away with Lazarus by his side. He called out, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am in agony in these flames. But Abraham said, Child, remember that during your lifetime you received your good things, and Lazarus in like manner evil things but now he is comforted here and you are in agony besides all this between you and us a great chasm has been fixed so that those who might want to pass from here to you cannot do so and no one can cross from there to us he said then i beg you father to send him to my father's house For I have five brothers, that he may warn them, so that they will not also come into this place of torment. Abraham replied, They have Moses and the prophets. They should listen to them. He said, No, Father Abraham, for if someone from the dead goes to them, they will repent. He said to him, If they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, neither will they be convinced, even if someone rises from the dead. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Is there really a hell? This is a question both Christians and non-Christians most often ask me when they find out that I'm a pastor. You see, the ideal, the idea of eternal punishment and agony and fire seems inconsistent with the idea of a loving and merciful God. Christians ask, if my God is a loving God, how can I reconcile a loving God with the ideal of hell? And non-Christians point out such inconsistencies and wonder if why anyone can believe in such a God. And so we find ourselves asking, is there really a hell? When people come to me with such a question, I sit down, I lean in, and I thoughtfully answer, I don't know. I just don't know the answer, but I can tell you what I think. And maybe that can help you clarify your own views of hell. In today's story, Jesus clearly describes an afterlife that consists of either a peaceful existence with God in Abraham's bosom, or an agonizing existence of torment and fire. Though this is a clear example of the idea of hell in scriptures, it's not the only one. 
This concept of hell is written about in both the Old and the New Testaments. In the Hebrew scripture, our Old Testament, the word used to describe the realm of the dead is Sheol. It simply means place of the dead or the place of departed souls. The New Testament Greek equivalent to Sheol is Hades which is a general reference to the place of the dead. And the Greek word Gehenna is also used in the New Testament. It is derived from the Hebrew word Hinnom. Revelation 19 and 20 describe it as a place of burning sulfur, and those in it are in eternal unspeakable agony of an unrelenting nature. So the word Bible does describe such a place, we are greatly disturbed by the idea of eternal torture and agony. Can we really believe that our loving God created a prison which inflicts unimaginable torment? I personally reject the teachings of those on the extreme sides of the spectrum on the doctrine of, doctrine of hell. Those who take a very literal interpretations of stories like the one we read today, as well as those who teach there is no hell whatsoever. You see, I fall somewhere in the middle. Jesus speaks with some regularity about judgment and a place of outer darkness. And he embodies this judgment when, in anger, he casts the money changers from the temple. In the book of Matthew, I can picture Jesus with a clenched jaw and an angry look in his eyes as he describes those dismissed from the Son of Man's presence of the Last Judgment because they failed to see the hungry, the thirsty, and the naked doing nothing to help. I cannot ignore this idea of judgment if I am to take Jesus seriously. At the same time, I recognize that Jesus speaks in metaphors and similes and uses hyperbole frequently in order to make his point. This is what he does in the parables. Now, we must take Jesus' comments about judgment and negative afterlife seriously, but I don't believe we must take them literally just as I don't think we take literally his command to cut off our hand or pluck out our eyes if they cause us to sin. These directives from Jesus are meant to be taken seriously, but not literally. Jesus not only teaches about hell, though, but he teaches about heaven as well. We all know John 3.16. I reference it often in my sermons. He assures us that God so loved the world so much that he gave his son so that whoever believes in him might live with him for eternity. Jesus also teaches us to pray, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. This tells us something about heaven. It tells us that heaven, in heaven, God's will is done. Heaven is at that place where God's reign is complete, where God's will is always done, where people no longer hate, kill, steal, mistreat, go to war, or inflict pain on others. And those who enter heaven have agreed to submit to God's will. Hell it seems to me, is a place for those who do not wish to live according to God's will and submit their lives to God's reign. You see, our God, he wills people to join him and to live with him and to love him. He is a good God, a loving and merciful God, and he will not force persons to be with him. He beckons them to choose and to willingly follow him. If one does not wish to do this, there is a place, a kind of a dark kingdom, reserved for all those who wish to do things their own way. A place absent from God. 
what would a, such a place look like? Well, it is filled with people who believe the world revolves around them. It is filled with people who are always looking out for number one. People feeding on another until there is nothing else to feed on. Hell is a place where goodness has been removed and where the light of God's presence is absent. Dante may not have been far off in describing one scene from hell where one resident is gnawing on the flesh of another. So in essence, this may be a powerful picture of hell, a place filled with self-absorbed, absent people, absent of nearly all goodness. And this world is darkened, as we would expect, by the desire to be as far away from God's reign as possible. This sort of hell, it is important to remember, is not something God created. It is instead something born of the people's choice who reject God's love, rule, and reign. If heaven is filled with those who say to God, Thy will be done, then hell must consist of people to whom God says, Thy will be done. Hear that again. If heaven is a place where people say, God's will be done, Hell is a place where God says, Thy will be done. Preacher Adam Hamilton writes about a man who has a very interesting and terrifying near-death experience. He writes, An an atheist before the experience, and now a United Church of Christ pastor, describes his near-death experience this way. I always believed you died, and after that, nothing kind of darkness. But now I was in that darkness beyond life. And it was hell. I was left alone to become a creature of the dark. I desperately needed someone to love me, someone to know I was alive. He notes that at the moment the words and tune to a song he learned as a child began to enter his thoughts. Jesus loves me, this I know. He continues saying that as he began to sing this song in his mind, for the first time in my adult life, I wanted it to be true that Jesus loved me. I didn't know how to express what I wanted or needed, but with every bit of every last ounce of strength, I yelled out in the darkness, Jesus, save me. And far off in the distance, I saw a pinpoint of light. And shortly after this, the doctors resuscitated him. Now, in my mind, this man's experience of a place of utter darkness seems consistent with some of the biblical descriptions of hell. But somewhere deep inside me, I still wonder if that was truly a near-death experience of his soul, for it was something chemistry or biologically based happening in his mind as it was deprived of oxygen. And so I go back to our original question, is there a hell? I don't know. I've never seen it. I've never experienced it. Now I'm not God and I do not know the ultimate truth about the issue. But what I do know for sure is that God loves all of us and God wants to be with all of us in heaven for eternity. God does not desire for us to be apart from him, but rather to be close to him, to choose to be with him in an intimate relationship with him. So I choose not to spend my time trying to figure out if there's hell and what it means to be absent from God, I choose to understand that the gospel of Jesus Christ is real. That God became human flesh to teach us how to live, to die in our place so that we can be with God for eternity. And I choose to share that gospel with others. I choose to live out that gospel 
by loving my neighbor and embracing every person with love, grace, and forgiveness. I trust that in doing so, the citizens of the kingdom of heaven will grow and grow as people choose to live, to follow God and submit to God's reign. So I don't know about hell, but I do know about heaven. And I do know that all who believe in him will have eternal life with God. So brothers and sisters, I choose heaven. I choose to invite others to heaven. And all of God's heaven bound children said, amen. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen.